Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. On this episode of Terrible Lizards, we talk media. Do journalists and broadcasters, as well as writers, represent paleontology correctly? Plus, Dave introduces you to a brand new pterosaur. Hello once again, this is episode two of series nine, or the indefinite ongoing monthly uh, podcast, the di- terrible lizards, the ness of the stompy stomp, brawl, roar, flappy flap, extravaganza. I quit. <laughs> of animals that are no longer with us, but were alive in the time of the Triassic, of the Jurassic, and of the Cretaceous. Is that better? Well saved, because that's genuinely not what you were going for when you started that <laughs> sentence. I, I, just, I just saw all the sort of like life drain out of Dave's eyes, and I thought, I better i better make this this is a proper um scientific podcast about dinosauria and pterosauria and other things we are a monthly podcast um if you want to ask us questions we do a special bonus questions uh for patrons and you can find us over on patreon.com for as little as a dollar a month so um dave what we're going to be talking about this time well since last month we did dinosaurs in museums and uh, trying you know that kind of arm of communication i thought it would be nice something i've actually wanted to talk about since we pretty much started is you know the kind of relationship that we paleontologists and people have with the media in all its various forms i have done bits of tv and radio but obviously particular print media and and how that goes basically because again you know we are a bit of an exception in that we have a podcast and have that kind of direct relationship with their audience but the vast majority of people i end up communicating with it's kind of through a third party and so you are one step removed and everything that goes into those steps uh, and all the possibilities you know really dramatically change how people get their information and where they sit if you like um, in that landscape and I thought that was worth talking about. Yeah because as we all know reporters and journalists do understand everything perfectly and are able to digest the abstracts of scientific papers without any issue whatsoever coffee can kill you and you can live forever if you drink a cup of day and red wine is really good for you but only if you drink less than half a milliliter or something. Or something yes. Yeah pretty pretty much that and you know to our audience I think a lot of them would obviously probably recognise a lot of what we're going to say or i suspect a lot of people if you thought about it for a while you'd go oh yeah that is probably what happens but i suspect an actual direct knowledge of those interactions probably doesn't happen that much people people don't necessarily know exactly what happens or what goes into it or how this stuff comes about and therefore why you end up with reports often being the way they are Uh, and it's worth saying i think up front because i'm obviously going to mode a lot of (laughs) How <laughs> journalists in the next hour. A, some people are absolutely fantastic. That's what I say. B, remember, some scientists are, let's say, not as honourable as they could be when dealing with information. I mean, a blog post I wrote years ago is what I called science by press release, which is your paper doesn't quite say the thing you wanted to say, or it didn't quite come to the conclusion, or the evidence wasn't quite strong enough. Don't worry, just tell the media that that's actually what it said, and then they'll report it for you, and everyone will think that's what your paper says which is dishonest uh, you know just straight uh, it's you know it's dishonesty people misreporting your stuff or you making a mistake in how you communicate to people and that's very easily done i mean i've said loads of stuff that's nonsense because when you're on a live radio show or even just a live call with a journalist and he's scribbling it down because his deadline's in two hours and you go oh i think such and such said that and it wasn't and it's that they said the opposite or so it's, it's easy to do you can't live fact check yourself um but someone sitting down and going well I really wanted to make this point and the paper's sort of about the same subject so I'll make that the title of the press release it's not on but the fact remains people do it and therefore stuff like that does get reported so you know there's an immediate way that you can get misinformation into into you know even good scientific journalism is a straight up genuine error or straight up dishonesty and exaggeration and manipulation I mean surely though a good journalist should I mean if they have time fact check that because if somebody has stated that in a paper it's not impossible to go and look at the abstract of that paper or in that paper even do like now 
with papers. You can do this thing called word search. So you can actually yeah. have a look and see what they actually said. But then you've also got to be able to do academic language and able to be interpret accurately what they're saying. Right. And and also it's the timing issue. I mean, I've I've had emails from journalists going, Can I speak to you about your paper? Um, or can you, you know, answer these questions about your paper? I'm writing it up for a deadline. And I've responded within half an hour, and the response is, it's too late, I filed the story. And you're just like, oh, okay, you know, that, that's the amount of time we're working with. And with the current, you know, it's not just the 24-hour news cycle, it's the, the kind of onlinedness of it. You know, it, it's not the print edition at 6am in the morning, and yeah. if you miss that, you'll get the lunchtime edition. It, it doesn't work like that, and obviously, particularly for, you know, the sexier dinosaur stuff, being <laughs> the first, well, right, but, you know, you know, the media is running off hits, and those hits ultimately equate to money because of the adverts on the page and the more tra- traffic you drive to the page the more people will see or click on the ads and that's how they make their money and so if a big story breaks you know if it's something like t-rex did x and you are the fifth or sixth story launched no one's even sees it uh. you know obviously you know your core readers if you're you know msnbc or the telegraph or whoever it is they will see it but you know word gets out there's a big new dinosaur story there's a big new t-rex story T-Rex news into Google. What is the top one? And the top one is almost certainly whoever got it out first. And so, you know, being fifth or being tenth is basically irrelevant. And therefore, yeah, there is this massive, massive push to get stuff out as soon as possible when a story breaks. How desperate are, I mean, desperate sounds is the wrong word, but how <laughs> keen are archaeologists and other academic uh, writers and scientists interested in getting their research into the media? Does it do you any good professionally? It varies massively. I know people who are completely uninterested in it and kind of when it happens, it's like, oh, great. You know, it, it turns out that this is a good story and I've been picked up and I've, I've got some traction with it. I've seen people who put out press releases for absolutely everything in the hope that something will go through um getting into the media has definitely helped my career at least in part because in my job at university i am considered somehow something of an outreach person i you know there's some slight forced modesty there but like it, it's something that like, is in my contract effectively it's, it's you know we want you to do this stuff because we think you're good at it and it draws attention to the university um i know my uni has a basically a bunch of web crawlers set up so that obviously whenever they're mentioned in the news they basically find it and when it's positive news that makes them look good and they like that um and certainly they have a calculator which is obviously at some level really vague because you know the, the reality of trying to work out money like this is of course incredibly difficult but they're basic they basically have a calculator that kind of works out what would that cost them in advertising to get that amount of print or digital space you know if they paid the times and said right we want to have five column inches worth of material saying how great we are uh, on page six what would that cost and they know what that would cost and so if a story comes out about my research and says queen Mary, you know dr Hope, queen Mary university love it very happy or even if it's just someone else's research and they phone me up and there's just a half inch at the bottom going we spoke to him and he said yes this is a really cool paper and da, 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 da. that's also good for them um they worked out that i'm generating you know over several years hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of advertising by their metrics which are almost certainly dodgy but you can see why the university thinks that's probably quite a good thing and you can see therefore why academics think it's quite a good thing the other side of that is the actual science side of it if you like and people learning about your work um and there's a phenomenal example of this which i love bringing up um do you know the freakonomics book i do know the freakonomics rounds a few a few yeah. years ago so pe- people who don't this was a big thing in kind of like the mid 2000s ish or 2010 kind of time no it was before 2010 it was definitely was it early yeah, yeah. okay i think it came out when we first met i think it's that old. oh did it okay um i'm Bloody not up. sure uh, uh, in the Neolithic. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so it was, a, it was an economics professor and a science writer got together to, to basically do this stuff where they looked at kind of quirks of statistics and natural experiments. And this is a really cool one. So there was shown to be a correlation between um, stories appearing in the New York Times and them getting cited. And you go, okay, that implies at least that when you're in the New York Times, that's a big mainstream kind of bit of media scientists who wouldn't 
necessarily look to your work, see it and go, oh, that is relevant to my work, look up the paper and then end up citing it. However, there's the possibility that it's just, well, yeah, but the New York Times only writes up the really sexy papers that are cool and interesting to lots of people anyway, and therefore it's the opposite effect of your, your only, that, that paper would have had it anyway, and therefore it appeared in the New York Times. And the natural experiment was, there was a printer's strike, so the writers were still employed to write their stories, they were just never printed. But that means you could see what stories did the writers pick and then what happened to those articles versus the ones that were actually published. And yeah, it turns out that the ones that the New York Times writers picked to write about, but it never got published, were cited less than the ones that were. In other words, yes, your material or, or reports of your science appearing in the media will increase the number of scientists reading and citing your research. And therefore, yeah, it's good on both sides. People find your work and people hopefully think think better of your institute. And that is basically part of the uh, the game of being an academic. If we were to make a like a, a, a ball game of being an academic, the more citations you have, the more you're winning. I mean, to a degree, it's obviously way, way, way more complicated than that. But it is a certain interpretation of what's going on. Then we get into citation metrics and it's horrible. And it's all skewed and there's all, you know, there's biases against women. There's biases against minorities. There's biases against subject, frankly. I mean, I think, you know, some of my very best papers are on pterosaurs yeah. and have very few citations because no one works on pterosaurs. And I wrote a couple of rubbish papers on early birds, which I'm really not proud of at all and have been cited a huge amount because there's so many people working on that subject and so many papers published on that subject that I picked up some random citations for terrible papers. I think you can also do a citation if you look at, um, like, if your name begins, like, with an A, B, C or D, you're far more likely to get cited than if your name begins yeah, with good. a, like, you know, um, I'm, I'm trying to think of the end of the alphabet, guys. I'm doing really well. Yeah, I, d- I did wonder if that's what was getting X, you. X, Y. X, X would be quite a good one, yeah. Wow. But again, you know, but, but there's a good example of science of, you know, how does that work? So some fields at least list their authorship alphabetically, regardless of contribution. Uh. Biology and paleo, it's generally the lead author is someone who either did the most work or was the the kind of grad student or someone who led the project and then the what we call the senior author is the last author. Uh, but there are some fields who, regardless of who did how much work, if your surname begins with A, you go first. Uh. Uh, and certainly some of the giant physics papers that we've had, you know, with like a thousand authors on them for the Higgs Albert boson and stuff like that. Einstein. Well, no, there, there, no, there is... <laughs> There is a, so a friend of mine at at uni, he's a physicist, and he's on some of these CERN papers where he's, you know, author 967 out of 2000 or whatever. Um, And yeah, because they do it alphabetically, there's a guy who works at the Large Hadron Collider whose surname, you know, is Abadas or something, A-B-B-A-D-A-S. And he's the first author on a ton of these super high-end papers, which get thousands of citations within a year. And he's just like some, you know, relatively middle-ranking technician. He just happens to have the alphabetical first name. And so he's the lead on all of these papers. That would skew those metrics through the roof. See, what I'm seeing now is if you've got a physics paper due in, if you just put Abadis et al on all of your quotes, yeah. then you're probably going to be fine. You'll probably get away with that in your exams. <laughs> yeah, no one's going to find Yeah, they just took a random year at the end. No one's going to check which one it is. Oh, I'm jealous. Of, I'm jealous of you physicists now. I have to learn <laughs> names. Okay, okay. But realistically, you've either got, you know, people like me or the university or the institute, whatever it is, putting stuff out um, as a press release, or you've got science journalists and writers hunting around for stories and, and people picking stuff up. So we talked about my giant T-Rex project that I'm doing with Jordan Mallon. That's one we didn't put out, but people picked it up because there was a conference abstract for Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. They saw it and went, oh, giant T-Rex, that's obviously a story. And 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 there it appeared without any activity on our part whatsoever. I mean, once they started speaking to us, we knew something was happening and obviously people were asking for quotes and yada, yada, yada. So it's not that like we had no control over the story, but we didn't put a press release out. That was just it being picked.
picked up. In fact, part of the reason we didn't is we wondered if it might happen and we certainly didn't want to push it. We would hope that the paper would come out first post peer review and then we've got some final data that's probably a bit less, um, you know, uncertain because it's been refined a bit and we have more control over it because we can put the, the press release out. Whereas now, ironically, if the, if we, you know, the paper's still churning its way through the journals, at, at least at the time of speaking, even if we get the paper out now, we put out a press release. A lot of people go, oh, that was, that happened last year. That That's, that's past news. news. And it's like, well, no, actually it is news because the last one shouldn't have happened the way it did, or at least we would not have preferred it that way. So basically what happens is you go along to a conference and you announce that this is what you're working on um, with your abstract. So you've written a paper, but it's still got to be peer reviewed. And that means that people could still come back and you'd have to change bits of it if you want to get published. And the press ring it up as gospel before it's had, um, before it's basically been through the sort of scrutiny. I mean, they they can do. And, and again, this is at least part of the issue is that, you know, conference abstracts very massively and conference talks very massively. People have given talks about a paper that has already been published because it wasn't when they submitted the abstract because you're often doing this months before the actual conference takes place. Um, and some things are very, very secure. You know, we have found this new skeleton. It's got six, you know, it's got six fingers on the arm and it's got 27 teeth on each side of the jaw and it's at least half the size again of Allosaurus. You probably haven't screwed those things up all right six fingers you might have done um <laughs> but but you, you know what i mean like uh, no amount of peer review is probably going to alter the fact that it's a very large animal or how many teeth it's got or that it's definitely a predator or that it's definitely a new animal from south america that's probably not going to happen and therefore reporting on it um yes you'd still like the final paper to be done but it's probably very very accurate whereas something like ours where we're doing some complicated modeling and delving into lots of if and if and if if we think this may be, um, that's easy to communicate in a 20 minute talk to an audience. It's very hard to communicate in 250 words of text, which is what they've initially lifted. And then we might, um, and we might have got it wrong if we've screwed all our numbers up and we won't find that out for a while yet. So what I quite like about this is I'm learning that academic conferences work a bit like the Edinburgh Fringe Festival if you're a comedian. You're, you're testing it out. In that, yeah, you basically go, right, I've got an idea for a show and it's seven months away from doing so you submit yeah. the title of your show and what it's about in 250 words you send that off that's all done and then that show it turns out when you've done a few previews is rubbish but you're still stuck with the title stuck with the content so you've got to hand, kind of like have a, a little bit of an intro saying oh and then you can get into the real story um you know that actually works later on so yeah yeah that would be that would be bad if you were reviewed on just your show description rather than the actual show i yeah. can see that being an issue yeah basically that so yeah there, there's there's one again another way that it can go wrong because they might be reporting on something which is correct in the sense that that's what you said in the abstract i mean i i have seen talks by academics getting up and going in my abstract i said this um but i've run another analysis since then and no it's completely Completely the opposite. Wow. It, it, you know, it's it's negative, not positive. But forever and a day, that abstract will sit and say that there's a positive relationship. And there's no way of changing that. No, because it's an item of record. You know, you you can't go back to the Edinburgh Fringe catalogue that was published a month before you showed up and edit every single copy that's been sent. Out. Right, which is why conference abstracts are not great as sources of data um, or sources of information or even, you know, in the case of our big T-Rexes, concepts even, um, which is why we'd prefer that, you know, science writer... I certainly would prefer the science writers stuck to actual published papers. But again, that's not the game they're playing. If someone else has gone, ooh, that looks exciting, and I'll write it up and they can, and other people leap on it and start writing it up because they can, it's irrelevant what you want them to write up. They're running that story, often multiple times. So be aware that that's what's going to happen. I think the zeitgeisty nature of it is very... Because it's not only what's new, but it's also, of what's new, what is the most exciting and interesting to people who are not academics yeah. and don't know the ground at all. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and and that's another big one that you see in that 
just because the, you know it might not be the focus of the paper at all it may not be what the people are interested in at all but it's of interest to the writers so you you know you will regularly see you know new study shows that i don't know you know dinosaurs were faster than t-rex you know there's a whole bunch of dinosaurs that are faster than t-rex isn't that interesting and then you get into the paper and the paper's about you know some new ornithomimosaur and you go oh neat it's a new ornithomimosaur where the hell's that headline come from and you get into the discussion and it's like um it looks like it's a a pretty slow one actually it's much slower than the others but probably still fast enough to escape from large theropods but of course the science writers are looking for an interesting angle and they know that the average person reading a science story has never probably thought about the relative speeds of dinosaurs and so the fact that there are and and they think of t-rex as like this ultra id predator that is undefeatable and the most perfect thing ever so learning that something was faster than that that it couldn't catch is really interesting but the paper's got a throwaway line about it and is reporting on a paper that's 20 years old that did the speed calculation but that's the headline and the story um and again most people reading that i mean with my science with my science communicator hat on i'd say most people reading that have learned something people who didn't know that there were dinosaurs faster than t-rex have learned that there were dinosaurs faster than t-rex but it's probably very little to do with the paper at all um and so that happened a lot and it again we talked a little about this about the museums last time you know you've got to think about you know again our audience here listening to this is the overlap with the actual generic target audience of the average writer for bbc website the guardian you know los angeles times chicago sun tribune is not the same thing at all you know there is almost no overlap between those two until you you know the the people listening to us are not the target audience they've got to boil it down they've got to get it in i've seen stories which are four or five lines that's the journalist has been given yeah. you know you've got a hundred words to explain this story tweet about this Pr- pretty much you know and then you as a and then particularly if you've got some you know like my big t-rex one it's like well yes we have said that but no it's a model and the model is based on alligator and we compared them and then we factored in great there's no possible way they can get that in there um and i you know and i saw that already i i you know and, the, and then the, the reaction stuff to it but just so in case people have missed it what paper is this what was your well so it's not a paper it's, so it's a conference abstract we sorry it's a conference abstract put out by jordan mallon a good friend of mine in canada and myself basically doing an analysis to try and work out how big t-rex got uh t-rex is the model it would apply to all other dinosaurs indeed it apply to almost all fossil animals the point being that we've only got 50 partial t-rex skeletons at best and of them only about a dozen are any good if you picked a dozen and random humans what are the odds you've got someone big basically nil so t-rex almost certainly got way way bigger than the biggest ones that we found but where does that limit actually sit and this is us trying to predict that um but for example i saw a headline version of it go up online and underneath the first comment was uh it's a big lie they've made it up we've never found t-rex is that big well we haven't made it up it's a calculation and we never said we had found a t-rex that big and that's not what we wrote that's kind of the point of the paper <laughs> yeah well precisely but you know so that's someone's reaction to the headline where the headline wasn't inaccurate but didn't spell out the details and you know at least one person has walked away from this going no oh, that paleontologist is lying about their research which is miserably depressing but something that's very very common unfortunately um uh, but you know that sort of thing you know the standard below the line comments the standard youtube comments the standard twitter responses but it's only exaggerated and exacerbated by either questionable reporting which of course also happens but also just you know a bit like we talked about the museums last time you know the limitations of what they're doing here journalist you are not an expert in this you've got an hour and you are only allowed 200 words and no images off you go yeah um you know don't be shocked they don't do a particularly good job a lot of the time or even if they do do a good job it's the best job they could do given the limitations and therefore it has issues with it i think they should do two types of abstract one for the conference and one for the journalist if you could write the journalist's little 250 words for them about what the paper's about underneath the actual abstract that might really help well but but that's what a good press release ultimately is um i mean i i've seen my my favourite ever example of dreadful journalism 
was and journalism here i use in not just quotes but <laughs> very very large ones with the word journalism being very very small um i can't remember exactly what paper it was it was something i was doing while i was in china but i put out a press release and some random website it was something like the indian online journal of technology it was something very very random um put up and they reproduced the press release in full as in they just copied and pasted it put their own reporter's name at the top of it as if he'd written it whereas he hadn't he hadn't written a single he word of it copy and paste oh no but he did do two changes twice the word paleontologist appeared and in one it was replaced with an anthropologist and in the other it was replaced with archaeologist so his sole contribution was to change my job title twice wrong whilst plagiarizing everything else entirely and changing the technical details they mean of it. the same thing dave <laughs> they mean the same thing surely so looking at old the humans um yeah <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that was particularly egregious but stuff like that happens and if you hunt for stuff you will regularly see you know chunks or whole sections of um yeah press releases completely repurposed this is just only slightly edited um and so yeah if you're writing a very good press i mean if if i put out a really good one that i've really put time into depending on the story you know i will have multiple different quotes of the same quote as in i will say oh this is very interesting because it shows da, 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 da. and then i'll write like a longer one with some background and i'll write a couple of short versions of it because they want to be able to copy and paste and drop that into their story and hit their word limit in the shortest amount of time possible so providing them half a dozen different quotes which all sort of say the same thing but in different word lengths and different complexities and different tones and then if i've got co-authors doing it for them because so the mammal paper the microraptor mammal foot paper that we had where out you at Christmas, found where you found the foot of a little ratty type thing inside a microraptor which is cool so, so there's a great example where i had co-authors in the us and canada uh, and then there's me and we had quotes from people from each of those places knowing that the local news would rather you know north american newspapers would rather quote an american the canadians would rather quote canadian the brits would, or the europeans would probably rather quote me but if we give them those options they're more likely to stick some of those quotes in and therefore they're more likely to run the story if we've done the job for them so yeah writing a press release which gives them you know it, it's an art in its own right you know give them an extremely sexy title which is going to get them to read the press release and that they might even be able to use as their own headline give them the key facts as early as possible give them a bit of background and context give them images nowadays if i put it get putting out photos i would put out multiple different versions of the same image again give it to them in different resolutions in different scales in different orientations because things will look different on a phone to different on a desktop to potentially being in print do their job All for of this them. basically yes the more you do their job for them the more likely they are to run with your story and the more likely one person is particularly a senior pl- story a sorry it's a particular senior outlet the more likely the others are um the mammal foot again is a great example it got into the bbc the times um the telegraph and a couple of other big ones in the uk very early as in there was an embargo date they put it out on the minute they were they you know they were waiting to run this story and then you get a flood of calls because other journalists hadn't seen it had missed your press release or had ignored it and then suddenly they're the only one not doing it and that now there's the scramble yeah um so that generated more interest you know i had nothing to do with it at that point but if the bbc thinks it's running it we can't be the people not running it if the bbc thinks it's worth running particularly when we know our readers will see it on the bbc and go oh well, what does my favorite journalist say about that or what does my media outlet that i pay for say about that and don't find it so they need it that's cool i mean it, it does feel i mean what if so you've got the words media whore are, yeah. are floating around your brain they are yeah, slightly not quite I'm, I'm impressed though Dave, because i i often find with with the sort of work i do which is obviously <laughs> i write books and for entertainment and i do entertainment i just find writing press releases the worst thing in the world ever because all the press releases releases are about me you know it's a bit yeah. easier to do one for a book and why books are exciting and interesting but to do one about you as a person why everybody should look and listen to you is the most horrible thing in the world and because you have to not be modest and for americans listening modesty is uh, it's a difficult concept um no <laughs> <laughs> not for you um, um, but yeah, it is it is a real skill being able to capture people's interest 
and plug at the same time, um, and in yeah. your case, educate. Yeah, but it, but it, that's, but that's kind of the uh, what's it, almost the currency is that yeah, I, I will, you know, I do my level best not to exaggerate or overstate, um, but at the same time, yeah, if you if no one's listening, there's not a lot of point doing it. But if you can grab their attention, the 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 outreachy bit kind of follows by default. The very fact that it's gone out into a dozen media places and lots and lots of people have almost certainly read it, and most of the content was relatively accurate if people just take away there's some dinosaurs there's some feathered dinosaurs eating early mammals we've done the job i mean, there are there are times though when stories are com- i would say completely misinterpreted by the public because it's very hard to tell because i haven't read a lot of the scientific papers and i'm thinking of things like spinosaurus exclusively hunting underwater which i don't think even their original paper said but it said definitely said they did do it and your paper yeah. saying that, that they didn't do it that got into they only hunt like tuna fish or um they've never even touched water was the sides of the argument that sort of seemed to come through in the press yeah or you get stuff that you can see how it happened but i don't think it's very good so the you know the 2014 spinosaurus paper the kind of first regen with this new you know juvenile fossil and some of that had some body size estimation stuff in it for the bigger ones. Um, and so, of course, you know, they came with these very large sizes from, yeah. Um, but one of the things they said is, you know, it's going to be hunting relatively large prey in water, including things like sharks and da 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 da. And of course, the headline was shark hunting dinosaur. And it's like, that's not what they said. And even if you read what they've actually, well, A, they, you know, that's definitely not what they said. But even if you read what they've actually said, all they've said is you know that's the sort of thing we expect them to do but there's no evidence for it you know there's no there's no shark vertebrae or shark jaws with spinosaur teeth jammed in them or a bunch of shark teeth in the gut of a spinosaur it's perfectly reasonable but we don't know and so yeah to take you know shark hunting as the takeaway is you know again not quite disingenuous you're not you know certainly not a lie you can see where they got it from and you can see why they ran with it but that's really what not what the paper was about or trying to argue even what it did argue lots of stuff i disagreed with um and that's become a thing is you know spinosaurus ate sharks and spinosaurus ate the biggest fish in north africa and it's like well actually we've got no idea exactly what it was going on it's big and it's got big teeth yes but i think this might be a shark thing anyway because didn't you write that paper about um um a pterosaur being eaten by the tyrannid yeah the shark tyrannid which which again was another disaster for that reason yeah we we had i mean there, there's an example of seeing something coming and being unable to avoid it so yeah we we had a, a pterosaur a pteranodon with a shark tooth stuck in its neck um and we wrote a paper about this there's some, there's some other pteranodon bones with shark teeth marks on them we know sharks are eating them but this time we actually got the teeth stuck in we don't know if it's predation or scavenging but it's certainly plausible and mark witten who's one of the authors um mark's a wonderful artist did a lovely rendition of a shark taking a pteranodon off the surface of the water and if you've seen big sharks hunt when they hit things like birds or seals at the surface they drive up through them so they come half out of the water or even fully out of the water at times um and we wrote in the press release and even in the caption of the image this shark is not jumping out of the water to grab pteranodon this is a shark hitting pteranodon on the surface and the momentum lifting it off and you'll never guess what at least half the headlines were scientists prove that's always the danger word we've had that discussion before. scientists prove sharks jumped out of the water to catch pterosaurs in mid-flight amazing was a headline that appeared multiple times it um annoying yeah yeah it is because you know when you're saying you know you you can when, when i've just said you know if you get the media right the education follows there is misinformation coming and it's purely you know and there's one where i will lay the blame completely at the door of the media of clearly not reading the paper fair enough that happens in a short deadline but not reading the press release they're even stealing it from not reading the subtitle they probably read the yeah. headline but just not subtitle what i strongly suspect happens is one person 
person did it once by accident or frankly malicious design and everyone else went oh oh look at that exciting headline we should write that up the trouble is when you have the words jump and shark in the same yeah you're gonna yeah. you're gonna go want to write that even if it's not true this is the issue well r- well right but you you know you you and i would suggest that journalists science journalists should probably be writing truthful things that people have said yeah i mean i'd, I'd like to think that'd be true of journalism in general but particularly for science relying on evidence and data and i can hear a million famous people laughing uh. <laughs> yeah oh i i know um and you know here's a good example of that actually so years ago we had i think it was limusaurus um so a, a dinosaur that i helped describe when i was out in china and a um it, you know it, it got a lot of attention because it's a very cool early herbivore of a otherwise carnivorous lineage um and one of the big science writers who i won't name um but wrote basically something like you know in it it it, it, it in my head, it read like, because I think he's American, but in my head, it read like, you know, Hollywood trailer voiceover guy. In 2005, they found them. Right, it was that sort of thing, but it, it is just like, you know, it described, so he said, you know, two years ago, Xu Xing and his team sat down in his office to puzzle out what they were seeing with this bizarre fossil and piece together its life history, and now the results are finally out. Or something like that was the opening light. Nope, we never had a meeting like that. There was never a meeting in Shu's office. There was never an all parties meeting to solve the paper, digitally or in person. It never happened. It was the same old as everyone else of five different people having five different parallel conversations and bits of the paper and authorship and flying around and ten different versions of the manuscript editing. Like, it never happened. And yet their opening paragraph was to try and make such a big deal of how we'd solved this problem that we'd had this meeting that we hadn't had. And it was like, it's just been made up. It's just been made up. But I remember take, whatever, the second half of this is explaining this to, to, to having this conversation with a colleague of mine at Queen Mary who had been a journalist for many, many years before he went to decide, no, actually, I want to be a scientist and then did a, did a degree and a PhD and was a scientist. And he went, oh, that's entirely normal. It, it, like, the, he, he was baffled that I thought it was an issue that someone had made something up. He said, yeah, but it's just background. It's not the truth. It's like, no, no, but I find it unconscionable that you could just make some stuff up as long as you get the other stuff right surely you should all of it should be true what is truer than the truth is a story day it's not i mean if you have to summarize something really quickly it's easy to say a bunch of people met than it is to say oh but this this was long form blogging where it was a big like multi-page description of what you know and it's like but i mean i mean you know for example um i think in this country if you know your kings and queens of england you know you know the thing about henry the eighth divorced beheaded died divorced beheaded survived everybody knows that he could talk about his wives of course um he never got divorced so you know but the fact that we call it that is easy to summarize people know what we mean but you know annulled beheaded died annulled beheaded survived doesn't sound as good for whatever reason there are certain falsities which tell more of a story than the actual truth the legal truth so i kind of understand but also i see where that's frustrating well, yeah, but it's, you know, as someone who's not a journalist, I think that's the issue is that, you know, I'm from very much from the outside in that regard. You know, my question then becomes, well, where do you draw the line between what you're allowed to make up and what you're supposed to report as being accurate? I, I, I you know, that's why I can't help feeling the, the all truth side version of this might be the most morally defensible one and the one with no slippery slope attached Indeed, to it. Indeed, but also the one that nobody will read. So, <laughs> well, but, 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 but they're in... I think is is at least part of it is you know you say it helped tell the story i'm really not sure it did you know would shu Xing and his team have been puzzling over this for five years be any less of an intrigue or a story as to how difficult and awkward and weird it is as they sat down to have a meeting to fix it it's an unnecessary detail that isn't true yeah but anyway but they, they but there you go listeners uh they're all liars they make <laughs> you know, none of it's real um but yeah you know we have rambled even by our own standards but yeah the you know that intersection between conference talks conference abstracts peer-reviewed papers press releases 
quote to the media, live interviews and all the rest of it, and, you know, how that goes through and reaches people, um, you know, extraordinarily complicated and, you know, far from as simple as we'd like. Um, and one thing I will say is it's weird how scientists always get the blame, um, despite the fact that every survey that goes through seems to scientists come near the top of like, like trustworthiness for accuracy and journalists do very badly. When the media really gets something wrong, I get all the flack for it. It's like, you know, why does your paper say that? Why, why did you let them print that? You know, um, why did you tell them that when they quoted you? I didn't. The paper doesn't say that. The press release doesn't say that. They quote it. I've been quoted from by people I've never spoken to. Um, and not even as in they've lifted something from the press release and written it as a quote, which even I think I think dodgy. is dodgy unless yeah. it's a specific one because press releases are often written by multiple other people. And also you're a chatty man. You, you know, people can ring you up, you know. I mean, I, I mean, you know, and then the, the press release too. I mean, my, my first experience with a proper press release was done when I was at Bristol doing my PhD and we put one out for a rinkosaur that we were naming. A rinkosaur? We yes. So um, weird little, uh, not dinosaur, not even an archaeologist. Saw they're just outside of Arkansas's squat little tusky piggy thing. <laughs> oh, they're weird, and I didn't want to have to describe them, and now I have, and I've done a bad job because I wasn't thinking about Rinkasaw. But the point being, you know, we we knew it'd be of local interest because it was from the southwest of England, and I was at Bristol at the time. We didn't know if it'd go further, but we at least wanted to reach like the local journals. Um, and we told the press office, they went, yeah, 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 send us the paper, and we'll write something up. And their opening line was new dinosaur found, and we're like, it's not a dinosaur. Don't call it that. It's an it's an ancient rep. No, we're calling it a dinosaur because otherwise people won't read it. You're not calling it a dinosaur. It's not a dinosaur. We're calling it a dinosaur because people won't know the difference. And you're like, isn't the whole point of this educating them? Uh -huh. And they're like, what, why do you think that's a problem? And I'm like, oh my God, this is the media department of a university. And this is their attitude to accuracy. Because what they were interested in is getting as much media attention as possible. And accuracy was not their priority. And that was a horrifying revelation as a 22, 23, like, oh, it works like that. So again, just quoting the press release, even if I'm the author of the paper, the press release I may have had very little to do with entirely. Um, so yeah, you know, but but again, scientists do make mistakes in quotes, in live, in stuff. You know, again, the mammal one, I made a mistake with the initial press release, which we desperately tried to correct and largely fixed. Um, but, you know, and some scientists are disingenuous, but the vast majority of the time, you know, those errors that crop up are not up. Us, they are errors that have been generated and propagated by the other people. And when you see the paper, it's usually pretty obvious where those errors have come from. There isn't just, Dave, like Twitter and the um, science journals and the newspapers. There's also television. Yeah, which, I mean, I've done some live TV, which is obviously terrifying. And there's been some famously... <laughs> ropey incidents not as a result of me um well, the name and but the presenters yes that, the, for, those, for those who know are getting a giggle um but he, you know even radio i mean the first time i did live radio i think i had something like an hour and a half chat with a producer and a and a kind of researcher going well these are the questions we want to ask you so tell us what the answers are now and we'll discuss them and then we'll try and boil them down because if they're complicated we're going to need to either ditch them or move that you know huge amount of rigmarole going into it, which is all fine and I understood that and we went live and we got eight minutes and the uh, interviewer asked none of the questions that I'd been over for an hour and a half. That's <laughs> because, that's because Dave, you know, as the interview, you get put in front of someone you just think, oh, I just ask them what I want to watch because the researchers don't know what they're doing. So, yeah, yeah. basically. Um, so so that happens. Um, it also happens for TV. Um, but the other side of it, of course, is, you know, stuff like documentaries. We've muttered at least a bit about them before. Um, I've got one coming out soon. This is incredibly good timing. Um, for those in the UK, at least the new Channel 5 ones should be starting about the time this comes out. I think I'm in episodes three and four. You'll see me if you're desperate What's to. What's it called, um, Dave? Uh, it's, I believe it's literally called Dinosaur with Stephen Fry. Nice. I think the with Stephen Fry is the only way you'll ever find it online. If you just put Dinosaur into YouTube, you may not turn up this show. Um, but I, I was going back through some of the emails um, that I'd had because it was coming out and the university trying to do something. I was going back through the emails with the, with the producers... Um, um, and the director when we, when we were doing the background stuff for it. And, you know, here here is an example. I found an email that I'd sent where they'd sent me some animations for this T-Rex run cycle. And I went, here's all the problems with it. And they sent me some more. And I wrote back going, I like, it's all the same problems. Like, they're different, but all the same problems are still there. You haven't actually fixed any of the things I told you to fix. 
um, you know, why not? Um, and then it, it turned out. So what was happening was I was speaking to a production manager for the for the film company who were you know basically making the documentary. Um, and what happened is I would email her my list of corrections, and then she would have a video conference with the lead production manager of the company who was doing the animations, and he would then speak to the animation team about what I wanted. Chinese whispers, and I believe, is how believe, we... Or telephone. Yeah. Yes. It wasn't going right. And I and I literally said, can I just speak to them directly? And they went, no, we don't do that. And it's like, and then you wonder why, and this is the thing, and it was a two-week cycle, because they'd go away and work on it for two weeks and then send it back. And I'd go, no, it's still all wrong, or it's wrong in new and interesting ways that I hadn't predicted. I think T-Rex running like a sexy chicken oh. is a good thing. <laughs> you know, you know, th- thing things like this. Um, I did w- one of the Attenborough ones that I had. I was one of the um, advisors on, and they sent me um, the animation of Microraptor climbing, um, and they said, "Is this any good?" And I went, "No, it's horrible. It's got lots of problems with it, and it's not what we discussed." And I sent you reference videos to copy from, and you haven't copied any of them. Um, it's really not good at all. Can we change it? And he went, "Well, no, because we've already shot the background plate with Sir David talking, and so it has to climb." that thing in that way otherwise the shot doesn't work and i'm like then why did you send it to me yeah uh i've had that uh the you know the chris packham t-rex one that i did um i mean the the big problem that happened with that one you know at least the t-rex in it is lit <laughs> now now it's now it's two years later and chris almost certainly is listening is the t-rex in it is pretty terrible um one of the main reasons it's pretty terrible is originally we had a shooting or we had a production schedule of 20 months so just shy of two years and then a month into it the BBC apparently decided this was such a great idea they wanted it out this Christmas not next Christmas Ouch. so we went from 20 months to 8 months and I got a phone call um, from I can't remember if it was a producer or a director I think it was the director going um, we need to do something at the Tyrrell Museum that would sort this bit of the script out because it's really not working and I went uh, this, is, yeah, this is a phone call and I was going like well you know give me a couple of days to have a look and have a think and I'll, I'll get back to you soon you go no no we're there it's like you you were supposed to be going in three months. You go, no, no, we arrived this morning. Wow. Um, and they haven't got the stuff available because we weren't supposed to be coming for three months, so we need to fill something else in. So I'm in London, and they're phoning me from the museum asking me what I can remember is on the shelves that they might be able to get the Tyrrell staff to get out for them to look at to fill a five-minute segment. And then, you know, it comes out, people go, ooh, it looks a bit thrown together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, should, you know, it's amazing that it's as good as it is when that's how it's running um but again that stuff happens um the t-rex design i put a huge amount of effort into that with gabriel Agurto. um we did loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of stuff and then yeah the animation team which was working in canada and therefore like eight hours out of sync with us which means your working days never overlap we're doing stuff in about two weeks and again i could show you you know tens of pages of notes of stuff that i sent them that basically were never fixed because it was all done without my knowledge and input and when I gave them the input they said we haven't got time to fix it. I mean at least like I, I did a, a documentary um, called Lost Pirate Kingdom on Netflix which I think was really good in many many senses and it had a lot of live action and in the script before the live action was uh, done um, it, there were things like they wanted me to say and they could tell it was a British ship because it was flying the Union Jack and I was like no it Anyone? wasn't it was flying the flag which we now call the Union in Jack, but it's flying the king's colors. That's what you, yeah. And you know, but it was still, even after I'd corrected them in the thing, it was still said you had, you know, in the action yeah. and in the thing. And also, in terms of animation, Dave, we're talking super speedboaty type tool ships just going yeah. at about probably 90 knots. Um, nice, <laughs> it's just it's incredible, but it, you know, the, these things you have to take with a pinch of salt, and I think a lot of viewers do. I think they kind of understand that they're only getting a sort of like interpretation mishmash type thing. But yeah, it's very yeah, frustrating I... when you see, you know, things that you know to yeah. be wrong in a thing that you've been involved in. Yeah, 
yeah, I know. I, you know, and with with the with the T Rex, the Chris Packham one. Um, you know, the BBC then put out a press release saying it was the most accurate oh, T Rex ever used, and you know, well, of and course I they're going to say that. Their press release. But, well, I know, and I, and I just got slated for it, and it's like, well, if they if they put out a version of what we designed for them, quite possibly it would have been. Um, I mean, the main thing that went wrong with that is they scanned Tristan the T Rex in Berlin, and that was their base model and because they didn't tell me they were doing that um they just wrapped basically our design over the top of it tristan's really squashed yeah, it's like very... one, so- one side of his face is down compared to the other and that's what it looks like because they've just taken the fossil as being reality hey dave of... you don't you don't know that might have been a very weird dinosaur <laughs> that yeah. was naturally very squished and you know maybe got sat on when it was an infant and it's yeah it's got super long teeth because as with so many t-rex fossils the teeth are falling out of the socket and I went, you, you got to put them back. They're like twice the length they should be. And it's you know, it different cool. numbers on different size. The eyes were wonky. And yeah, and it just got worse from there. And, they, you know, and then when they're saying it's really accurate. Well, it is really accurate because they've used the actual fossil and not done any human abstracting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at all. Yes, yeah. in in that regard, arguably, yes. I mean, However. <laughs> zombie dinosaurs day. If that's what we want as the public. Um, that would be brilliant. So anyway, shall we? we have a look into the modern news in a segment we like to call what's the news dave what's in the news yeah, I, was gonna, I was gonna say do we have a do we have a title for this segment <laughs> the the irregular segment where we've got five to in ten my minutes head, to it's um short. shooting stars tune so what's in your bag angelos it's like oh what's in the news dave what's in the news dave um, anyway, sorry. Um, if if I'm pronouncing it right, because it's a horrible name, uh, ba- Balian Ignatius, I think is how you're supposed Balian to Ignatius. say it. Balian Ignatius. That sounds lovely. That sounds like a college that has a type of, that's made out of a specific rock. A Balian Ignatius. Yeah, I mean, I think it's basically supposed to be whale jaw. Um, so this is a new pterosaur, which was out oh, two weeks ago at the time of recording. Um, so yet a, yet a, yet another small Tina Kasmatid pterosaur from the Salmhofen. Um, so Tina Kasmatid Chasmatids are relatively small. There's a handful of big ones, but they're mostly one to two meters in wingspan. Pterodactylus, the pterosaur, um, is a Tina Chasmatid from the Solnhofen. So usually a fairly big head with long straight jaws, loads and loads of teeth in them. And there's some kind of filter feedery animal. Um... And we've got a ton of them already. I mean, this is this is a very, very well-known kind of branch of pterosaur evolution from the late Jurassic. Um, but this one's really nice in two different ways. First of all, the preservation is gobsmacking. I've never seen the pterosaur in person, annoyingly, um, but I I saw very good photos of this over 10 years ago. So this is yet another case of something that's been sitting around in a museum that kind of everyone knew it's about. because nobody but... cares about pterosaurs, Dave. It's just you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's at least part of the problem problem but the the preservation is you know even by Solnhofen pterosaur standards it is extraordinarily good you know it's every bone absolutely exquisite preservation it it couldn't possibly be better if you tried um so yeah it it, it is just a skeleton there's no soft t- well that's not quite true there are some very small bits of soft tissue hanging around but it's effectively just a skeleton on a slab um but it looks like it died yesterday it's so incredible even when I saw it it's like this is one of the best things I've ever seen and I haven't seen it anything better than it in the last 10 years either it's that good so that's really nice and then it's a new taxon at one level not a big surprise you know we've been digging stuff up from the Solnhofen since the 1780s but we're still finding new stuff um uh not just new specimens of things we already know but new taxa um they're still coming out there's at least a couple more specimens sitting in collections that people know about which are waiting to be written up so there's, there's even more coming um but this one is neat because of the arrangement of the jaw so what you usually see with um, the Tina Casualties release we have in the Solnhofen is they either have really quite short teeth and they're probably kind of fairly generalist feeders. So Pterodactylus itself probably isn't a filter feeder. If it is, it's not much of one because we've got at least two, I think, now with fish inside the stomach. So they're probably grabbing little shrimp and fish and maybe doing a little bit of filter feeding for bigger stuff if there's a small rock pool or sandbank or something like that. 
Um, and then you get into the far more kind of filter feedery ones, things like Tenochasma itself, and in particular, another thing called Nathosaurus, which have dozens of teeth, and they kind of point sideways. So it's got a long, very, very straight head, um, and then the teeth stick out kind of to the side, which is in itself rather weird. Um, but what Bailey's Ignatius has got is the teeth are going up and down, so like Pterodactylus, and in fact, more like what you'd expect from a classic filter feeder, because again, when you look up filter feeding, whales and the heads the name you know and they open their mouth up they've got all the vertical plates hanging up and down flamingos have something pretty similar despite the curved beak they have these kind of um prongs in the jaws which are doing a filter feeding job so it's got that and so it's got hundreds of teeth i think it's it came into like 280 teeth or something oh, i was just thinking about the poor researcher who counted them in total so like 70 each side top and bottom but that's still a that's a hell of a lot and then the jaws go straight for ages and a little very end they open up so they go you know they spoon push to like. the sides and then come it yes so spoon bill but with a straight front end rather than a rounded front end so just like a spoon bill again a big kind of not filtery thing but doing that big dabbling mm-hmm. duck mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. at a macro scale but then with no teeth at the very front of that very straight jaw which is really kind of weird. And so there's quite a nice discussion in the text about different filter feeding mechanics and animals that kind of suck stuff in or animals that take stuff into the mouth and then push water out. So which side of the mouth are you catching the food on? And what is the water traction, uh, sorry, water direction? And where is the pumping happening and how is that moving stuff? Um, And whatever Bailey Dignatus is doing, it appears to be doing something a bit different to all the others, Um, which is then kind of nice because it means that actually you've got stuff like pterodactylus um doing one thing mainly nathus doing one thing tina casma doing one thing and then the classic filter feeding pterodostro which is from argentina and the cretaceous which is a very flamingo like curved jaw with loads of teeth around the side but all the way around probably doing something else because that has teeth up the front which this doesn't so it looks like you've got a real diversification of filter feeding strategies even within one filter feeding specialist group which is pretty cool when you compare that to stuff like, yeah, ducks or flamingos, where they're all doing it pretty much the same way in the same group. In my head, I have it like, you know, when you go to a really posh banquety place and they have all the different spoons and all the different cutleries and all the yes. different knives. <laughs> and imagine if you're a pterosaur, and it's just different pterosaur heads to eat every different meal. And how you go, and you've got instead of a bowl of soup, you've got the sea. Um, that's that's how yes. I'm imagining this. That doesn't really. I mean, pretty pretty much actually is is what's going on. But it's it's really quite nice. Um, and it's a little one, so it's something like a meter twenty in wingspan, which is at the bottom end. So it's pterodactylus sized. Uh, certainly, Nathosaurus and um, uh, Tina Casma itself get rather bigger size of a relatively large seagull uh, yeah about that a little smaller um it you know it's a really really nice specimen great to new taxon even though we've got loads of taxa from there already and the taxonomy of that group is a bit of a mess there's lots of little things that some people lump together and some people are split up and some people say juveniles and this is like nicely different to everything and you know it's very obviously new and different um yeah and it's so it you know it does fill in some some gaps in our knowledge and show that they're even more diverse than we thought and there's even more stuff going on and not enough um, people researching there. them so do your phd in pterosaurs make dave happy come on yeah <laughs> yeah basically yes that <laughs> lots more excellent well then i think that's um we've had i don't think i can do a fi- a, a, a uh i was gonna say a filter flappy goodbye i don't know what noise a filter flappy thing so i think we'll just go with a, a good old rah actually no i'm gonna squawk you can roll um because you love my squawks day I, I can eye roll this is exactly you can eye roll and a squidgy noise doesn't make very much noise yes no, okay so um, until next month and you know if if you are a patron we'll be putting out a bonus episode so do check that out on the patrons patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards um and if you want to join go there um but until next month <laughs> oh god it's good isn't it should have taken my headphones off should have done thank you for listening to terrible lizards for extra content please go to patreon.com forward slash terrible lizards for questions contact us there or on terrible lizards pod at gmail.com Buy Dave Hone's dinosaur books, including How Fast a T-Rex Run, and to find out about Izzy's podcasts and books, head to iszi.com. Say hello on social media using the hashtag TerribleLizards. Thank you so much for listening. A review, a recommend and a follow makes all the difference. Stay stompy. <laughs>